If I were to summarize what I do on my YouTube channel in one sentence, I would say that I use popular media to promote and analyze complex ideas. For example, I will use a video game like Fallout New Vegas to teach philosophy, or a manga like Berserk to teach psychology and mythology. Though I discuss a variety of ideas and subjects, my interest does make me gravitate towards certain topics over others. And if I were to pick which one generates the most enthusiasm from myself and my audience, it would be alchemy. This interest is really simple to explain. When artists use alchemical concepts and symbolism in their work, it's often done to communicate secret messages to the audience, ones that reveal undiscovered details about either the works themselves or the spiritual inclinations of the artist. Add in the mystic allure that goes along with an esoteric tradition like alchemy, and it becomes very easy to blissfully go down the rabbit hole. Though, with the numerous alchemy-focused videos I've put out over the last four years, a number of reasonable questions have followed. Questions like, how and why did I get into alchemy? And what books should I read if I want to become an alchemist, or if I just want to study it? With this video, I will answer these and other related questions. Before I begin, I will implore anybody that is confused or has any follow-up questions to leave them in the comment section below. I will do my best to answer as many as I can. First, let's get the easiest question out of the way. How and why did I start studying alchemy? So, the answer to that is related to another subject that I discuss frequently. If there's a topic outside of alchemy that I'm probably most known for discussing, it would be the psychoanalytic theories of Carl Jung. I got into Jung around the time I started analyzing the Silent Hill video game series on my channel, which was around late 2017. I wanted to figure out what the developers were influenced by to see if those influences might explain the mysterious things happening in those games. With my research, I found that the theories of Carl Jung matched several things in those games. Things like his theory of synchronicity and how the mind communicates through symbols. Around the time I started doing videos linking Jung's theories to Silent Hill, I came across another YouTuber named Reinstall Paul, who did his own series of analysis videos on Silent Hill. In his videos, he demonstrated how alchemical symbolism could be found in every aspect of Silent Hill 1, and to a lesser extent in Silent Hill 2 and 3. When I watched these videos, I remembered that Jung had written many texts where he linked his psychological theories to alchemy, but I had avoided them, mainly because the Jung fans I had spoken to had said that they were very difficult to understand. Nevertheless, I picked up those books because I had to see if there were any connections. In doing so, I found connections between Silent Hill and alchemical concepts like squaring the circle, the union of opposites, and the three-step process for creating the Philosopher's Stone. Now while I was reading these texts, I began to understand why Jung had taken such an interest in alchemy, and why he tried to link it to his psychological theory. To put it as simply as I can, Jung believed that what the alchemists were trying to do was use the material world to symbolize psychological processes happening within them. In other words, Jung believed the alchemists were the first psychologists, aside from the Gnostics. If you're already confused, don't worry. I will use an example that should make things a bit clearer. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Philosopher's Stone the ultimate goal of alchemy, the stone which contains within it the elixir of eternal life. The alchemists believed that to obtain the physical philosopher's stone, one must simultaneously create the mental, spiritual philosopher's stone. A popular representation of this would be in the Harry Potter series. He was only able to get the external reward in the form of the stone when he achieved the inner reward, when he became quote-unquote worthy of the stone. Now some alchemists believed that to obtain the stone, you have to go through a three-step process, the same one that Silent Hill references. These three steps are known as nigrido, blackening, albedo, whitening, and rubido, reddening. 
In the Nigrido stage, one must obtain what the alchemists called the Prima Materia, a piece of the void that existed at the beginning of time, from which the universe was made. That's the external part. Now this external part, Jung believed, corresponds to the unconscious mind, or the internal part. In the second stage of Albedo, one must remove all impurities from that chaotic piece of void, or in other words, change the black into white. Psychologically speaking, one performs the albedo stage by bringing unconscious contents into consciousness. Black equals unconscious, white equals conscious. The benefit of doing this, Jung believed, was that the unintegrated parts of our personality would no longer control our behavior. So if you're prone to anger, this is because that anger is an unconscious complex. By bringing that anger into consciousness, you bring that anger under your control. Finally, when all the impurities of the void are removed, the white turns red, rubido, and then it crystallizes into the Philosopher's Stone. Internally, when you integrate all the things about yourself that are unconscious into consciousness, Jung believed you achieve the best version of yourself. Just as the Philosopher's Stone is the perfect form of matter, the alchemist attains the same perfection within, an inner perfection that the alchemists symbolized with their idea of the Philosopher's Stone. This is just one of many examples of the alchemists using the material world, in this case a stone, to symbolize something within, according to Jung. Now I will address a couple of questions that I can already hear creeping up. First of all, some of you might be asking, wait, isn't alchemy about making potions and stuff? Originally, yes, but over time, it became less of a chemical process and more of a philosophy. See. From the Enlightenment era onward, alchemy's credibility as a science was completely obliterated. We know that putting the purest forms of the four classical elements into an alembic isn't going to produce the Philosopher's Stone, obviously. So aside from the occasional hermetic cult, alchemy became a lost art. It wasn't until Jung came along and linked his psychological theory to alchemical symbolism that interest started to pick up again over the 20th century. He saw it for its potential spiritual and psychological value. The three-step process for making the stone, like I said before, was no longer understood as a valid scientific process, but a symbol of psychological and spiritual development. To achieve albedo, for example, is just another way of saying that you are achieving higher forms of consciousness, with rubido being the hypothetical endpoint. Another question might be, well, why does alchemy symbolize psychological processes and no other spiritual tradition or religion? Even if we accept that Jung's theory of the unconscious is real, couldn't the same be said about all other religious symbols and that they too were attempts at symbolizing psychic processes? Actually, yes, but not entirely. It is true that Jung believed all religious symbols were attempts at symbolizing the unconscious. However, Jung gave greater credence to alchemy because he felt that its attempts at symbolizing unconscious processes were less contaminated. So for example, not all, but some of the European alchemists were prone to Christian bias. They would link the symbol of the Philosopher's Stone to Jesus Christ, and the elixir of life within the stone to the bloody water that poured from Jesus' side when he was pierced with a lance on the cross. When associations like these are made, there is a chance that they can obscure the true meaning of an unconsciously produced symbol, one like the Philosopher's Stone. To quote one of Jung's most famous collaborators, Marie-Louise von Franz, one could say that in alchemy, projections were made most naively and unprogrammatically, and completely uncorrected. That said, it doesn't make religious symbols bad or irrelevant, not at all. You can as Jung did, cross-reference alchemical symbols with other religious symbols and determine the common patterns from them. From that, you can determine for yourself whether it points to any underlying psychological reality and then derive any philosophical or spiritual value that benefits you. 
That is what the whole point of alchemy is. Anyways, now I'll get into the final question. How can I learn more about alchemy? I concocted a list of books and media to help all of you, regardless of whether you want to become an alchemist or you just want to study it. The first book you absolutely must read is called Alchemy, Science of the Cosmos, Science of the Soul by Titus Burkhart. This book is basically Alchemy 101. It will tell you all the fundamental alchemical concepts and the ways they can be interpreted. You will learn about stuff like the four classical elements, the tria prima of sulfur, quicksilver, and salt, which is likened to body, soul, and spirit, and alchemy's relation to the wider hermetic tradition. The book is very short, easy, concise, informative, and quintessential for beginners. Although be warned, Titus doesn't write from an objective point of view, but as somebody who expresses some degree of faith in alchemical doctrine. Nonetheless, he understands it well. After you read that book, or while you are reading it, it doesn't matter, you must also read The Forge in the Crucible by Mircea Eliade. Eliade is one of the greatest religious scholars in the history of mankind, and by virtue of that, his knowledge of alchemy is impeccable. Plus, unlike Titus Burkhart, Eliade writes about alchemy as an impartial observer. That said, if you do want to become an alchemist, this book does inadvertently teach the ways in which you can project inner values onto the outer world. This is because Eliade basically lists the different ways that cultures around the world did that, and then lists the cross-cultural patterns that emerge. By noticing the values and the patterns, you can begin to think like an alchemist. Before we move on to the more complicated stuff, I would also recommend J.C. Cooper's Chinese Alchemy. In a way, it serves as a review of the type of stuff that is in Burkhart and Eliade's books, but puts it in plainer language, and also shows more cross-cultural patterns. It's not necessary to read like those other two books, but it will help. Those are the simple books to get you started. Now, if you want to move up to a more intermediate level, you will want to get into the psychoanalytic texts, the ones that try to link alchemical imagery to psychology. The easiest place to start, I think, is with Marie-Louise von Franz's book that I referenced earlier, Alchemy, An Introduction to the Symbolism and the Psychology. She lays out in plainer and more accessible language here the way alchemical symbolism was used to foster psychological development. After reading that, you might be ready to tackle Jung's books. Now remember what I said, Carl Jung's books linking alchemy to psychology are famously complicated. They will not make sense if you try to read them first without having read the simpler texts. Trust me, save yourself the frustration that I went through when I tried to read them. After you read the simpler texts, the first book by Jung I would recommend is Psychology and Alchemy. This book will begin to show the inner psychological subjective realities that the alchemists were trying to uncover through their symbolism. Once you understand that book, you will be ready for Mysterium Conjunctionis, the most difficult book I have ever read bar none. The entire purpose of this book is an analysis of alchemical symbols that depict an alchemical concept known as the Union of Opposites. The name of the book is literally that. In Latin, it means Mystery of the Conjunction. You will have a hard time reading this book at first, but don't worry. If you find yourself lost, there is a companion book that I would recommend which simplifies it. It's called The Mysterium Lectures by Edward Edinger. If you read both at the same time, you will understand the implications of Jung's theory if it's true. And once you understand, your mind will be blown. I would go into greater detail about how these books teach you how to be an alchemist, but at this point, I feel I can only teach so much before my views begin to bias your own. The journey is best to embark on and learn about yourself, rather than just relying on other people's interpretation. I will recommend some YouTubers and other content creators that specialize in talking about alchemy. Again, there's Reinstall Paul, who I reference frequently in my Silent Hill videos. There's Third Eye Drops, who I actually did a podcast appearance with a few months ago. 
Finally, if you want to practice applying your alchemical knowledge, here are some pieces of media I would recommend. In terms of video games, check out the Soulsborne series with Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring. There's the Xeno series with Xeno Gears, Xeno Saga, and Xeno Blade. There are also two underrated games from the PlayStation 2 called Shadow of Destiny and Haunting Ground, which borrow heavily from alchemy. And of course, the Silent Hill series, but only one through four. Regarding TV, the obvious recommendation is Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. That anime uses a plethora of alchemical symbols and concepts and uses them incredibly accurately. There are many other forms of alchemic media that I am sure I missed. Feel free to add more alchemy-based media recommendations in the comment section below. That does it for me. I hope this video was helpful. Remember, if you have any questions or concerns, please leave them in the comment section below, and I will do my best to address them as soon as I can. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay citrinitas. And if you get what that means, you are well on your way to becoming an alchemist. Peace out.